Jesus approached the baptism, John was surprised and, and said, you know, really, you ought to be baptizing me. And Jesus assured him, no, no, we've got to do it this way because this is going to fulfill the prophecies and the things that Father has talked about. And so Jesus was baptized in water and then Heavenly Father proclaimed his approval by audibly speaking and people heard him as he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But immediately following his water baptism, something took place that may be surprising, even shocking to you. And we find this in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, at verse 1. Would you turn there with me, please? The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. We're going to begin reading at verse 1. And uh, if you'll notice, chapter 3 uh, ends with Heavenly Father's audible voice saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then... Chapter 4, verse 1 starts, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. you got to be kidding me. What's up with that? Here Jesus is obeying God, got baptized in water, Father declares His approval, and now He goes to be tempted by the devil? Hmm. Follow on with me, would you please? Verse 2. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. Excuse me. How many noticed I started quoting King James did a reading NIV? <laughs> Apologize for that. Let me go back and do that verse all over again, okay? <clears throat> Sorry, Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus answered, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Hmm. Again, forgive me, there's, there's times I'm reading from the NIV and suddenly the King James just starts going and I, and I get mixed up. I apologize. Is, isn't this stunning? Here we have Jesus having followed in baptism and then he goes right in to temptation. Now, I, I'm sharing this for a couple of reasons today. One, I want to encourage those who follow the Lord in baptism today. I want to encourage those who have recently received the Lord into their heart that that is not a guarantee you will never be tempted again. (laughs) In fact, if anything, the devil may get a little mad that you're following God. You know, and, and, and because, see, every one of us are tempted. Every person is tempted. Every human being is tempted. Remember the scripture says, for there is none righteous, no, not even one. Remember the scripture says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many remember those scriptures? How many would like to forget those scriptures? I'm with you. But unfortunately, they tell the truth, okay? Every person is tempted. And so Jesus Christ did an amazing thing. He came to the, God came to the earth in human form. Jesus Christ was 100% God. He was 100% man. He came here so that he could make it possible for us to be freed 
from the power of sin and to live life not only here and now, but live it eternally with him in the eternal kingdom in heaven with Almighty God. Amen? He does not want us to go to hell. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. I know there have been some of those preachers that preached on hell, and when you were listening to them, you felt like they were glad you were going there. I've been in some of those meetings. That's not what it's about. But hell is a very real place. But God really does not want us to go there. And so Jesus made it possible for us to live a life victorious, always victorious. Now, watch, watch this. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says that Jesus Christ was tempted in all points as we are. Whatever you've been tempted to do, so was Jesus. Jesus, as a little boy, was tempted to steal candy. Just like you and I were when we were tempted to steal candy. Jesus was tempted with chicks, just like you and I have been tempted with chicks. Jesus was tempted to lose his temper and beat somebody up, just like you and I are tempted to lose our temper and behave in a way that Later we go, boy, that was dumb, you know. But Jesus suffered everything like we did for one reason. Through him suffering that and taking it on himself, listen, but without sinning. That's the difference. Jesus didn't steal. Jesus didn't give in to the lust. Jesus didn't commit adultery or fornication. Jesus didn't lose his temper and beat somebody up. Jesus didn't give in. And because he went through all of that temptation without failing, he could then, on the cross, take our sin and die in our place. Pretty awesome, isn't it? In Auschwitz, the height of World War II, one morning in the parade ground, the Nazis were selecting another round of candidates for the ovens. And in one of the barracks, a man was selected to go to the gas chamber and the ovens. And he began crying out, I've got a wife and children, please don't do this. And to the shock of the camp commander, another man stepped out. A man who's become quite famous, actually, Father Colbe. A, a man of deep prayer and deep devotion to Almighty God who the day he was arrested, when the Nazis came and arrested him, he had his hand on a globe and was praying for the lost of the world. Father Colby stepped forward and said, take me in his place. And they did. Father Colby didn't go to the gas chamber in the ovens instead he went to the execution room. It's a long story. But I want to share something with you. As moving and powerful as that story is, there was a greater one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who stepped up and took your place Everything you have ever done wrong in your life, Jesus Christ took on himself. And he carried it for you so that you no longer have to carry that. Now, I want to share with you a couple of scriptures that sound impossible. Would you go to the book of Romans? Romans chapter 6. Now, the book of Romans is in the New Testament. If you're there at Matthew Go to the right. You're going to go past Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 
you'll find the book of Acts. After the book of Acts is the book of Romans. Okay, Romans chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 11 for just a few moments. Then we're going to look at 12 and 13 and 14. But let's start with verse 11. If you're there, holler amen. amen. Okay, here we go. Reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here we begin the impossible part. Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, are, are you like I am? I mean, there's not a day goes by that something in my flesh would just like to rise up. Maybe I would just like to slap someone in the face just because it might feel good. <laughs> Come on, you've been there. You're driving and you're happy-go-lucky and somebody cuts you off. And what you would like to do is pull them over and just slap them silly for a moment. Come on. <laughs> maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you're in the uh, bulk aisle and you see your favorite candy and you would just like to well, I'll just test it, make sure it's good. They wouldn't want to sell something bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Temptation. But he says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. That's like, are you asking the impossible? Forget it. I can't do that. And I think that is the reason many people go, I can't live the Christian life. I could never do that. I can't be that good. I've never been able to be that good. I understand the feeling really well. But look at verse 13 because it gets better. Neither yield to your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Are you you got to be kidding. Don't do anything wrong, not with my eyes, not with my tongue, not with my hands. You're not serious. Really? Is God really telling us this? Yes. Look at verse 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion? <sighs> Isn't it kind of like present with me every day? You've heard this story, haven't you? About the wife who woke up her husband one day, and as he opened his eyes, woke up, looked at her, He said, wow, I'm having a great day. I have not done anything wrong yet. <laughs> and then he quickly breathed this prayer. But God, I'm about to get out of bed. <laughs> what is he saying here? God is not saying that there's not the capacity. But he is letting us know there is this very real place that you can have in Jesus Christ where sin no longer is the controlling factor of your life. Look now, go over just a couple of pages to Romans chapter 8 and look at verse 11 and 12 in this chapter. Romans 8, 11 and 12. But if that same Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are no longer debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the flesh, we shall live. Look at what he's saying. 
Because when we ask Jesus Christ to come into our heart and life, the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit will come dwell in you, and the Holy Spirit dwelling in you will make it possible that you no longer are obligated to live by the stuff that once controlled your life. I think we ought to give God praise right here, don't you? Look, look at what it's saying. Has meth controlled you? Addicted to prescription drugs? Maybe your addiction is anger, the temper. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe fear drives you. Insecurity. Maybe you live with the shame and the memory of what happened to you as a young girl. I'm telling you, by the authority of God's word and by the power of Jesus Christ, you can be free. You can be free. You no longer have to live out of that life anymore. Why? Because of what it says in Romans 6. Jesus took that life on himself. And when he died on the cross, he paid the price. And when he was buried in the grave, that life was buried with him to live no more. And when he walked out of the grave, you walked out with him. And he makes it possible for you to live in newness of life. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Hallelujah. Praise God. All things are become new. And so I can live by a new identity. I can change the image inside. I don't have to live by that mirror any longer. That snapshot of that guy is no longer a true reflection of who I am. I am now in Jesus Christ, a whole new creation. And I can live by a new identity. I never done that. And because I live by a new identity... I can renew my mind and I can renew my emotions. I want to talk about that next week. I want to share with you specific steps how you can change the thought patterns and how you can change the inner image of who you are. Not by the power of just grit, but by the power, the miracle working power, the miracle working power of God that is so powerful and works so deep, it will go to the subconscious and even transform the subconscious so that you are truly living for, as a new creation from the inside out. I want to share that with you next week. But here, here, listen. you got to understand, not only do you have a new identity, you have a new position See, I'm no longer dealing with temptation from the place of defeat. I used to live that way. For many years of my Christian life, I lived from a position of defeat because no one had taught me, you know what, you're no longer defeated. Are you still in Romans chapter 8? Hey, go on down to the last few verses of Romans chapter 8 and see if your Bible says what my Bible says. Does your Bible say to you that we are more than conquerors? Yes. And that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Does your Bible say that? Yes. Come on, now don't just tell me religiously. Is it really in your Bible? Yes. Does your Bible lie? No. Is it absolutely true? Yes. Then who are you? You're more than conquerors. You're victorious. How frustrating is that? For the enemy. 
Wait a minute. They've already won. What am I doing? He's trying to convince you that you haven't already won because once he's convinced you you haven't already won, now he can defeat you. Dear ones, listen, get this deep in your heart. Warfare and battle and struggle is normal Christian living. Defeat is abnormal. Defeat is abnormal. We don't have to live defeated. Oh, there's going to be some times that you'll get knocked down and you'll fall flat on your chin and Father's going to go, what are you doing down there, child? Get up. Now, the enemy's going to convince you to stay down there so he can stomp on you a little bit more. But all you got to do is just get up and give him a real good punch right in the nose. Man, you win. You win. You are more than conquerors. You have a new position. It says in Ephesians 2, 6, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So from this new position, with this new identity, now I can live out a new life and I can win over temptation when it comes my way because I am more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. And so are you. That is who you are. (laughs) Sir, I want to tell you, Maybe you've been told all your life you're a failure. You can't do anything right. You're stupid. You are so dumb. What an idiot. You've heard that all your life, and it echoes inside you, and you have been working all your life to try and find a way to get out of that negativity. There's a way. You can get out of it in Jesus Christ. He'll make you a new man. Sis, I got great news for you. You are not a victim any longer, not if you're in Jesus Christ. When you receive Jesus Christ into your heart and life, that woman that experienced all of that abuse is buried to live no more. You are now a new woman in Christ. You have never been abused. You are a pure virgin daughter of Almighty God. You are free from that past. You can live victorious in Jesus Christ as a whole new woman, free from that shadow that hangs over you all the time. You do not have to live there. That is the promise of Almighty God. Why would we live in anything less? Why? The greatest miracle we have is what I'm talking about today. Oh, I love seeing people get set free from cancer, and it happens so much. Testimony this week, a retired pastor that had been suffering with cancer went in for the surgery, and they found no cancer in his body. Folks had prayed for him. It was gone. Come on, that's our God. But can I tell you, an even greater miracle is someone who has lived their life addicted to meth or addicted to alcohol or addicted to a temporary rage and their life flips and they start walking free never to go back into that again. Folks, that is a miracle. That is of miracles. Amen? We are so blessed that you join us online today. For more resources on how you can grow your relationship with Jesus Christ, visit us online at www.winacity.com. If you would like to speak with someone about your relationship with Jesus Christ or would like prayer, you can contact us at 541 567 or email us at info at winacity.com.